Number 497. and St. Saviour's received their charters from Queen Elizabeth I. St. Olave's from 1571 stood where London Bridge Station now stands, overlooking a graveyard where immigrants from the Low Countries were buried. This model, made by George Edwards, an old boy of the school, shows how here in the alleyway, or even among the tombs, the boys played their games. The coming of the railway in 1829 meant a change of site to Bermondsey Street. 1849, another railway line and a move to Horsley Down. All that survives of this building, the beasties from the gateposts. St. Saviour's began in 1562, was destroyed by fire and rose again in 1676. 1962 saw the 400th anniversary. It was a year of celebration. On the 17th of January, after Mr. Hubert Secretan, the senior governor, had invited nominations for a new warden, Mr. J.R. Thomas proposed Alderman Mrs. Louisa Jones. This was seconded by Mr. Harry May. Alderman Mrs. Jones was unanimously elected. 
the first lady to hold office in 400 years. The senior governor presents the badge of office, uh, with some difficulty. After thanking the court for her election in this historic year of the Foundation, Alderman Mrs. Jones presents a past warden's badge to her predecessor, Mr. J.R. Thomas. On the 2nd April, a not too serious extravaganza on the history of the Foundation was presented.
goes in there. It's an olive, it's a It's a side, it's an olive. It doesn't matter which way round you put them, really. They're both blunders like me. Now they say they're getting ready to go off the cake. Perhaps in another two years they'll have gone. I'm a London, but I'll be stopping in London. But they'll find something to keep an eye on me, Kate. They'll be all right. Don't worry. Well, good night, ladies and gentlemen. Good night, sir, brothers. On the 4th of June, the Quater Centenary Service was held in Southwark Cathedral. Parents and governors gather by the west door, while masters and boys leave the school at intervals and walk to the cathedral. The address was given by the Right Reverend Hugh Ashdown, Bishop of Newcastle, former provost of Southwark and governor of the school. pupils come from far and wide. The Reverend F.W. Potto Hicks, who joined the school in 1896, has come from Gloucestershire. The vergers escort the mayor and mayoress of Southwark into the cathedral, while over all the ancient tower surveys the modern scene and still spells out its Christian message to a busy world. That same evening, the commemoration dinner. The guests are welcomed by the captains and monitors. The Mayor of Bermondsey, Councillor Mrs. E. V. Coyle, J.P., with the Mayoress. The Provost of Southwark, the Very Reverend Ernest Southcott, arrives with the Bishop of Newcastle. After reception by the Warden, the guests proceed to the hall for dinner. Warden, past Warden Mr. Thomas, Lady Needham and Sir Wilfred Needham, who will begin the toasts. Seated at the end of the top table, the Reverend Potto Hicks, Mrs. McIntosh, Chairman of the Education Committee of the London County Council, and Dr. Hay, Chief Inspector. Honourable Member of Parliament, other honoured guests, ladies and gentlemen, pray silence for Sir Wilfred Needham, a companion of the most honourable order of the Bath, commander of the most excellent order of the British Empire, and an old boy of the school. Reminiscence of the past, and would you please indulge me for a moment or two? Uh, in one or two of my own. My eyes have been drawn during uh, this evening to the gallery up there, first to that corner outside the headmaster's room, where one used to stand clutching the misconduct report and awaiting the summons to come inside after the timid knock on the door. <laughs> How well I remember the pictures in that corner. <laughs> I suppose most of my fellow old Olavians uh, have been doing the same kind of mental arithmetic as I have since arriving here at the old school this evening. I doubt whether some of them have to do such big sums as I have because, because I have to go back 
some 57 years uh, to the day when I first arrived here as a new boy in making the long and remarkable history of the foundation of St. Olives and St. Saviour's and that is something of which we can all be very proud. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the toast the past 400 years. The toast is the past 400 years. used to be. At the old boys reunion on the 22nd of June, former pupils are received by the headmaster and Mr. Thomas. Small groups collect and reminiscence begins. After a few words of welcome from the headmaster, there's a chance to renew old Olavian ties and to purchase a history of the foundation, specially written for the 400th anniversary under the title, Two Schools. The open day for parents and friends was held on the 24th of July. 
Exhibitions of schoolwork were on view in laboratory and classroom. Prize giving in the evening was preceded by a concert given by the school orchestra, brass band and choir. The warden presents the prizes with second master J.R. Hawkins in the background to see that all goes smoothly. Each year a carol concert is given by the boys. This year's took place on the 11th of December. The old folk from Bermondsey come in scores. Solid characters wrapped in attention. Afterwards, the boys serve them tea. The second master chats with the visitors. Young and old together ensure that no food is left. And now, after the special events of the Quetta Centenary year, Let's look at the lessons of every day. The senior geography master, Mr. G. M. Chapman, takes a class. Under the camera's eye, the boys are all attention. T.G. Stevens, senior chemistry master, takes a class in advanced chemistry, a crucial subject for would-be scientists and engineers. For a pure scientist, the need is obvious. It is not always realized that an engineering degree now requires chemistry to advance level. Perhaps to the uninitiated, a chemist is equated with a pharmacist, but that is only a very small portion of a very wide field. Possibly biochemistry is the most interesting of the newer careers that the mid-20th century has brought forward, dealing with such matters as the purity of food. Senior biologist A.G. Buck takes a class in biology. 
The school has a long-standing connection with two of the large central London teaching hospitals, Guy's and St Thomas's, and the production of medicals has long been a strong suit. There are other avenues, of course, which biology opens, notably the work of the veterinary surgeon and agriculture. Another that is now coming to the fore is work in hospital, either as technician or administrator, both of which find a biological background of great value. From the biology laboratory, there's a splendid view of Tower Bridge. Craft work is not on the face of it one of the prime concerns of a grammar school, but all the same it has its place. It's good for academics to relax occasionally and make things for themselves. The principles of good design are very important and it is of course good for the boys who might look forward to being managers to know something of what happens at the ground level. It used to be thought that boys who were good at bookwork were not good with their hands, but this is not so. The best boys are good at both. J.C. Carmichael takes this class in metalwork. In the adjoining room is woodwork with S. MacDonald. An art class under K.L. Sleeman, who passes individual comment on their work and each week chooses one painting to be specially exhibited as the painting of the week. The tall opaque windows have proved admirable for introducing boys to the technique of stained glass. The art room too affords a view of Tower Bridge. A gym lesson in progress under E.H. Davies. No Swedish drill or formal movements, but informal exercises. One hopes that a boy will come back to academic work refreshed, not tired, after BT. Out of school, the clubs and activities are plentiful and vigorous. Raymond Allen, trumpeter in the Covent Garden Orchestra, takes the brass band. Easy enough to smile at these boys, not so easy to do.
Desmond Swinburne practices the orchestra. I want something great to say in the clarinet, and something great to you from the viola. Now, Oracy Sharp, I don't mind, but CA I'm after, right? <laughs> Printing club in its own little room is run by BC Firth. It does a thousand jobs from concert tickets to an intricate prize day program. The electric machine is used for larger jobs and the hand machine for tickets. All typesetting is done by hand. Out in the playground, the boys move like the slender figures of a Lowry painting. Practice at the nets, in the dinner hour and after school, for members of school elevens. Eton Fives, we are told, was first played against the chapel walls at Eton, where the buttresses provided the sides of the court, hence the curious shape of the side walls. There is no back wall, and the left-hand side is broken by a low wall known as the pepper box, which juts out into the court. Fives is a vigorous game which exercises all the muscles of the body. It is fast and demands concentration, quick thinking and great energy. A good player hits the ball hard with the palm of either hand rather than the fingers. Thus, unlike games played with a racket, there is no backhand stroke to learn. Perhaps one might add that it's a very gentlemanly game, played with no umpire.
on the understanding that gentlemen do not quarrel. And if differences of opinion arise, the point is played again. Lunch is in the hall. The queue forms up outside. The tables laid in long rows are parceled out among boy servers who collect the food from service tables. 500 meals in 50 minutes and no sense of hurry. The first floor landing with its notice board is the Piccadilly Circus of the school. Here lie the monitor's room, music room, staff room, hall balcony and library. And between lessons the toing and froing is considerable. Room 15, built originally as a chemistry store but owing to exigencies of space long since used as a classroom. St. Olave's Tower Bridge SE1, that is the address and here is the best view of all of the bridge. Finally, the library. In almost day-long use, during school and after, for private study and informal teaching. And so we come to the end of the day, leaving the calm of academic work for the busy streets, the dockland commerce and the crowded trains of the south bank of the Thames. In the past.